Αγαπητοί φίλοι στην αίθουσα και στο διαδίκτυο, συμπληρώνουμε σήμερα ε, τη σειρά μαθημάτων για τα Medical Statistics, καθώς έχουμε την τιμή να συνεργαζόμαστε με τον διάσημο καθηγητή Αντώνιο Καλαφιόρε, ο οποίος με περιοδικές του επισκέψεις στο νοσοκομείο μας και συνεργαζόμενος με το τμήμα μας, έχει συμβάλει στην ακαδημαϊκή μας πρόοδο και μας δίνει την ευκαιρία όλα αυτά που εμείς έχουμε τη δυνατότητα ως εμπειρία να αποκτούμε να τα μοιραστούμε με όλους τους συναδέλφους γιατρούς και να έχουμε επίσης την ευκαιρία τη σειρά αυτή των μαθημάτων να την αναρτήσουμε στο site της Εταιρείας Ελλήνων Χειρουργών Καρδιάς Τώρακα και Αγγίων έτσι ώστε στο μέλλον να μπορεί κανείς να ανατρέξει και να χρησιμοποιήσει τη συγκεκριμένη γνώση. Θέλω να ευχαριστήσω όλους εσάς που βρίσκετε ενδιαφέρους σε αυτή τη σειρά μαθημάτων και την παρακολουθείτε και τη live media γιατί ουσιαστικά είναι σαν να δίνουμε κάθε τέτοια διάλεξη στο Σταύρος Νιάρχος που είναι και να μην μας χωρούσε γιατί συνολικά παρακολουθούν αυτή τη μετάδοση περί τα 4.000 άτομα κάθε φορά. Και όπως είπα, στο μέλλον θα μπορείτε να τα βρίσκετε και στο site της εταιρείας μας. Θα ήθελα να καλωσορίσω για ακόμη μια φορά τον καθηγητή φίλο Αντώνιο Καλαφιόρα και να του δώσω το λόγο και να σας ανακοινώσω ότι το επόμενο μάθημα θα είναι πώς μπορεί να γραφτεί ένα paper πλέον με βάση και τη γνώση που θα έχει αποκτηθεί από τη σειρά αυτών των τεσσάρων μαθημάτων. Αντώνιο, welcome again in our hospital and thank you for giving us the opportunity to share the knowledge with you and to be in the place to spread this knowledge to all uh, our colleagues around Greece. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Sotirios. It's a pleasure, as usual, to come here and to, to share with you what I learned in the many years of uh, uh, clinical research, at least. Uh, this is, will be the last lesson on uh, statistics. Uh, next, uh, there will be one other one uh, on the, uh, the title will be how to write a scientific paper. But these lessons at the end uh, is uh, really very interesting because it uh, will deal with uh, most of the things you are currently and every time uh, seeing uh, wh while you are reading uh, a scientific paper. One of the most important uh, development we had uh, is uh, the so-called prediction of uh, the event, an event to happen. Most of the time, this event is uh, the death or survival of a patient. And uh, we call, in general, time-depending events because uh, this uh, uh, strategy was uh, developed for, uh, of course, survival for cancer patients, but was widely used for, most, for many events. The analysis of time-depending events is concerned with the studying the time between entry to a study, that is the starting point, and a subsequent event, end point, which can happen, however, or cannot happen. Original analysis was concerned with time from treatment until death and the name is survival analysis. This is uh, commonly used. However, any specific event as a reoperation return in NIA class 3-4 that can be identified in a specific moment can be part of this kind of curve, can have a curve for him, for it to happen. Of course, when you are talking about survival of patient, you cannot wait until the moment the last patient dies, or at least uh, you, must, you must put a, a, a stop to this. Uh, you cannot wait 20 years to see which is the survival at 20 years. Why? Because some patient will be alive the moment when you are observing your, uh, your statistics. Other patients during this time frame can, uh, can leave the study 
These are called loss to follow up. For instance, you know a patient, uh, the future, the outcome of a patient after two years, but you don't know what happened after five years. So you are checking what happened at five years. This patient is lost to follow up. Anyway, you have one observation during the time frame of your study. This is still included in your statistics, but they are, the term that identifies this patient is a censored observation. There are only partial inside. This will affect the curve, and I will explain you why. This is just the schematic how it happens. For instance, you wanted to a study that's, uh, to do a study that starts in August 2015. This is a retrospective study that includes all the patients that were operated on between January 2010 and June 2015. And you have uh, different time frames. The first one is 66 months, is the, the interval between the first patient and the moment when you are looking at his uh, outcome. And the two months, uh, be why? Because patients were operated on two months before. So you cannot have a real survival at 66 months, that is uh, the one that you are, can observe a maximum, because some patient was operated on two months ago. So how can you deal with this fact? You cannot, as we said, wait six years to see what happens after six years. This is actual survival. And this is termed, what you are talking about is means actuarial survival, means the probability to survive. I want just to explain how it works. Uh, why I am explaining this? Because this is the way I was doing it in the 80s. In the 80s, when uh, uh, the computers were not so diffused, the statistical page packages were sold only in the United States and were very expensive. I had books just to understand how it worked. And uh, this was uh, what I was doing every day. I won't just, not, not every day, it took one day to do a curve. For instance, I want just uh, the, to explain you the concept. Later on, the computer will do all the job. This is not a problem, don't worry. For instance, the first time interval is from zero to 12, means the, the first year of observation. How many patients entered this time interval? The whole statistics, because you, anyway you operate on all the patients have a time zero. Either five years ago or yesterday, this was the time zero. So all the patients you are observing, like in this case, are 300, entered this time interval. During one year after surgery, 27 patients died, okay? But we must consider how many patients are alive because they were operated on less than one year ago. So patients that are still in the statistics, but with the follow-up that is less than one year. So okay, in this example is 25. But you have another group of patients. Patients that were operated on, you have some information during the first year, later on you have no information at all. So these are patients that have an incomplete interval but are still inside one year. So how to deal with these different groups? The survival is very simple. You have a 300 patients, 27 died, 300 minus 27 divided the 300 is 91%. 91% is the survival at one year. And this is the cumulative survival is 91%. The problem is, the, now is, is the problem. How many patients are going in the second interval? between one and two years. Not all the patients that survived, so no 300, not 300 minus 27, but 300 minus 27, that the patient who died, minus 25, that are the patients that are alive, but with an incomplete follow-up, because they were operated on one year, less than one year before. And the patients that were lost at the follow-up, with a follow-up that was less than one year. So 300 minus 27 minus 25 minus 13, 235. So this is the number of patients that entered the second year. During the second year, 21 died. 33, again, were operated on, but uh, including the follow-up, but was not uh, less than 24 months because they were operated on one year and a half ago, for instance. And 18 patients with an, a follow-up between one and two years, but you don't know the outcome after. 
and then you consider 18. Again, the survival is very easy. 21 is that the death, the patient that died, you must do 235 minus 21 divided 235. So is the percentage is again 91%. Now to have, to have the community survival, you must multiply 0.91 to 0.91. So you have 0.83. So these are the second part of the curve. Now again, I don't want to repeat because of the concept. I hope that is clear. At least you must include all. You must subtract to 235 all the subgroup to have 163, 31 died, and so on. Now the survival in the third year is 81 percent. You must multiply 81 percent times 83.83 or 83 percent, and you have 67 percent. So I did that till four years. So this is the survival of this statistics for four years is 46%. So this means that the possibility to survive of this patient is 46%. But of course, you must include the patient that are eliminated from this. And this is just for Stella and for Sotirius. Why? You see here that we have a patient with incomplete follow-up. 13, 18, 11, and 6. These patients are eliminated because they are subtracted. So it means that the more patient you have, the higher will be the possibility, the, the more you will reduce the number of patients. So your survival will be affected, even if it's not true. So it means that the, what is important in the follow-up is to have the more data possible or the most important number of patients possible. Why? Because the less patient you have uh, without information, this will reduce the number of patients. So the deaths are always there. Instead of doing uh, 420 deaths, you will do 320 deaths. So the percentage is higher. And this means that you will reduce more and more your survival. So losing a patient at follow-up is not uh, something that you, cannot, uh, you can say, OK, it doesn't matter. It matters. The more information you have, the more complete is your follow-up, the better the result you have. So this will affect the survival curve. But anyway, don't worry. This is not, uh, you must not do it. But you have to do, uh, this is the computer that is doing it. This is the curve you have, the classic curve you see everywhere in all the papers. This is a 72.8, for instance, a plus minus 48. This is important, all the, all the journals now want to have the number at risk here. So how many patients are entering? Uh, this makes uh, a problem. So because you write 72.8, like uh, I wrote here, six years, uh, the one who is reading will uh, try to understand. Because if you have a 23 patient, it's not bad. But of course, you have only 23 patients. Perhaps uh, you have one death more here, the 72.8 will become 60%. Having one that at the beginning doesn't affect the survival curve like one that at the end. Here you have three patients, but if one of these three patients will die, the curve will go down here. Just to let you understand how is the system. The mechanism is very good and very important, but is affected by the amount of information you are giving the system. There is another possibility, as you, you see in many papers, uh, the contrary. So the possibility to die, not the possibility to survive, exactly the contrary. Sometimes you, are, you can show the curve like this. For instance, you have a 72.8, and you, you see two curves that are thinner. These are the standard error. This means that, uh, just to let you know, in uh, the possibility that uh, a, a population, another population with the same characteristics, as a survival, similar survival, at, is included between 82.5 and 63.0. Means that, that this population has 95% of possibility to have the same survival included in these two numbers. Of course, the smaller the interval, the more representative is your statistics of a general population. So if you are doing this curve with 50 patients, has a different impact if you do this curve with 5,000 patients. It's OK what I mean. This is a, everything is inside there. In this number, plus minus seems that is something you want to put plus, but minus, 
plus minus means how much your uh, identifies how much is your uh, your uh, statistics representative of a more global population and uh, you can have the same uh, aspect with the two with the uh, standard error sometimes you can uh, see the uh, you want to analyze uh, the effect on the survival of a single factor can be diastolic dysfunction, can be diabetes, anything. So you have two curves and the p-value that you see here. You can have the same, that two curves. I want to show what you see here. In this case was a LV dysfunction, diastolic dysfunction. You see here that you have the case summary. 113 patient, 27 patient died, 12 in one group and 15 in another group. You see that these are 38, 15 are a lot. Here you have a mean and median survival. Here you have the p-value that is calculated with the log rank, but don't worry, it's not, uh, you have not to calculate anything. And this is one very important thing. This is uh, the hazard ratio. Means that a, a patient in this specific subset of, uh, uh, of analysis, a patient with diastolic dysfunction has three times more possibilities to die in the follow-up than a patient without a diastolic dysfunction. So this is an information that you can use for even for clinical uses. So it means that if you see a patient that you are operating with diastolic dysfunction in this subgroup of patients, you can think that this patient anyway has a more possibility to die than a patient without diastolic dysfunction by a factor of three. And this is the hazard ratio that is giving you exactly the information you need. How, many, how much is the possibility compared with the someone that has not this risk factor that is going to die or going to be reoperated on anything you want. This hazard ratio is like the relative risk. Perhaps you will remember it. But anyway, it gives you, it's not important to go into details, but when you see hazard ratio, means the possibility for a time-depending event to happen of course, uh, in favor or not in favor of a patient who have or have not this kind of, of, uh, of risk. How to build a kaplan mayer curve? I want just to show you something that is very, very easy. This is a, I showed this last time, is a medical, as I told you, is a very friendly uh, system that can help you. Uh, you see here survival analysis, kaplan mayer analysis. Here you have, uh, months survival and the survival. These are survival time at the end point. In this case, end point is death, but can be death and uh, possibility to be in near class three, four. Can be death and uh, possibility of a revascularization. When you are writing a paper on the myocardial revascularization, you can uh, include in the survival curve, not only the death, but also the possibility to have an acute MI, to have uh, an adverse event, anything, even CVA, anything you want, you want this. This is uh, just, I built something for diabetes on insulin, and you see here, for instance, number at risk below the graph. You put here number of the risk below the graph. And you put survival probability just to make a curve that we are more, uh, this is the curve you obtain. Of course, like this doesn't look very good. But you can, uh, you can play on this. You take out uh, the, this one. You have uh, here the titles. You put uh, freedom from death, any cause. Here you put months. Here you put the percentage. And then the axis, as you are talking about months, we, have, we need to put 84. Of course, the computer doesn't know anything about what you want to do. You start from zero, and the interval is 20. It's perfect. Here, this is your curve. Of course, you can change the colors. Uh, you can put this color in red, for instance. OK, and this is, a, you can put a thin. OK, you have two curves, and it tells you that uh, these are the patient uh, non-diabetic and diabetic on insulin, anyway. And you see here that at that moment, you have no patient here. So when this curve has to be considered is not easy. But at least in this case, at least four or five years can be reasonable to consider it. 
It's okay. This is uh, very easy to obtain by this. Uh, all what I told you is uh, the concept, but the computer is doing everything. In uh, brief, to have uh, this kind of uh, a situ this is a month event. I don't know what happened. Anyway, this is month and this is the event. To have the uh, to build the kaplan mayer curve, you need to have uh, in one uh, column the months. You can have the years, you can have the days, but let us say the months. The months of follow-up from zero, that is the moment in this case of uh, surgery, and uh, a certain number of months that are the moment when you are doing your follow-up, when you had the information about the patient. And here you put. Uh, just let me let me see what's. Okay, now I, uh, I am glad because, <laughs> and, uh, and here the event, at zero, the patient is alive, and one, the patient is not alive, is death. So what you need, the, the time to event that is here, the event, dead or any event that you want to include. Anyway, if you have a risk factor, you need another column with, uh, for instance, diabetes, zero, one. And you can compare the curves for patients with and without diabetes and so on. So just to tell you that this is a very important point, building, uh, you, you must not build the curve that will be done by the computer, but you must build the data that the computer will use. So what is important, follow up and the status. Status can be dead, alive, can be near class, uh, return of angina, reoperation, uh, PCI, or anything you want. Now, the second big chapter that we have to talk is the multivariable analysis, or normally they are called the multivariate analysis, but recently they decided that the best uh, name was multivariable analysis. Perhaps they are right. The problem is uh, that when you are doing a so-called uh, univariate analysis, you are comparing an event, can be uh, infarction, can be death, uh, with a single risk factor. That can be important. And you see that this is uh, correlated to what you are saying. This does means that is really the one that uh, is important. I want just to make it, to do a very, a very uh, short uh, example. I think that this uh, changes in the slides is related to the connection. Sometimes they are changing. Uh, <laughs> the computer are not uh, nice with the, every, anybody. Anyway, let us think about patients that uh, they are coffee drinkers. You have uh, 2,600 patients, and uh, some of them are coffee drinkers. You see here, they're totally, sorry, but I think I have to correct this. Okay, anyway, it doesn't matter. You will see. Uh, this is a, you have a, a, totally, in the patient that are coffee drinkers, you have 1,300, 1, you have a 16.5% incidence of a myocardial infarction. And in patient that are not coffee drinkers, you have the incidence is 6.1. So you say there is a, a huge incidence of myocardial infarction in patients that are coffee drinkers. You see, let us see patients who smoke. In smokers, we have, uh, again, uh, 2,600, the same patient, of course. We have uh, 1,100, where the incidence of uh, acute MI is 20%. This must have to be here. In non-smokers, the incidence is 5%. Means that is very important. There is, again, a huge important statistic significance. Oh, now nothing happened. Let us do in a, a different table. We put here coffee, no coffee, coffee yes, coffee no, and the smoke yes and smoke no. If you look at this, if you took, look at all of the smokers, the incidence of uh, coffee drinkers in the smokers is uh, 1,000. And the incidence of myocardial infarction is 20%. But the, inc the incidence of non-coffee drinkers is only 100, but the incidence of acute MI is still 20%. If you do the contrary, you see non-smokers, you see that the incidence of acute myocardial infarction is independent on the coffee. Either they are drinking coffee or they are not drinking coffee, you have 5% incidence. 
means that when you keep constant the effect of smoking, the effect of coffee disappears. And this is the concept of multivariate analysis. The concept is that you put together a lot of variables, and the system, of course, not us, is taking out the ones that are not enough to justify any kind of uh, participation or, uh, or cause. They are not included in the cause of the event. Like in this case, this is a very simple, but I hope you will understand, you have to understand, that in this case, smoking is a very important uh, a risk factor, but the coffee is not. Now let us start step by step. A quick uh, uh, word, just a few words on correlation and linear regression. Why? Because correlation and linear regression is the way you are putting together how can you check two different variables. This is a, one of the most common graphs in science, that you are putting one continuous variable in the x horizontal axis and another on the y vertical axis to have this, this kind. This tells you, for instance, very likely there is a correlation between the two. The problem that by convention x is the independent variable and the y is the independent, but it's not very important because at the end of the story you have always the same result. We have two different uh, possibilities. We can use a correlation or linear regression. They give exactly the same p-value, exactly everything is exactly. The problem is uh, conceptual. When you are doing a correlation, you are taking uh, uh, data from a general population. You have no influence. Typical is the correlation between the height and weight of a population. You are just observing. If you take here all the people, that are here, we put in a plot uh, height and weight, and we see if there are correlation. Because we are using the, what we are using is coming from a general population. In the regression, you are influencing one variable. I will show you just a, 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 an example. Correlation and uh, reg linear regression give the exact p-value. So there is no way. You, you don't, uh, even if you are using one method or the other one, doesn't change anything. The first one is height height against weight. You, you take 20 patients, and 20 patients are here, number one till number 20. You have, these are the height, these are the weight. And at the end, you find that there is a, a correlation and between the two. The correlation is, done, is given by this value, that is R. And uh, this is uh, between minus one and one. What is important, this is the coefficient, is positive or negative. Positive means that uh, the more you are, uh, your height is higher, the more you weight. Negative is the contrary. The more you are, uh, the, the more you weight, the, the shorter you are. The, in this case, of course, is positive. And we have here the confidence interval, but it's not uh, very important here. At the end, if you plot one against the other, we have this one. And uh, this is a correlation, as we said, because we took uh, 20 people from uh, the general population. On the other side, if you are running and you measure your pulse at different velocity, you, this is a, a linear regression. Let us see what happens. You have the speed, one, two, three, four, till 15 kilometers per minute. Let us say this is your speed. And this is your pulsation. And this is what happens. This is a, a you choose a, a linear regression, not a correlation, because a, you are, making, you are influencing actively so because you are running, and you check what happens when you are running. And here you see that there, there is a R square, but doesn't matter, uh, is not uh, important uh, for you. This is the, mo the closer to one, the better. And you have here a p-value, and you have a formula. This will come back later on. This formula is very simple and very easy. You have uh, two values. From this form, you can predict the value of y, in this case the pulsation, according to x, that is x, that is the speed. And you must apply, this is the constant, that is the so-called intercept. So I will show you the, what the concept is very easy. So it means when, which is practically in this example, which is your heart rate when you don't move. You must start from, you cannot start from zero heart rate. So the, when the one is zero, which is your heart rate, and this is a coefficient that uh, gives you the, the idea how many times 
your pulsatility increases according to what you are doing. For instance, if you apply this, this formula to another person that is doing uh, a, this equation, for a speed of 10 kilometers per hour, the heart rate will be 67.3, that is this one, plus 3.4, let us state, times 10, that is the x, the kilometer per hour, means 111. So you can predict. This is a, in a little bit more complicated way, but not so much, is at the basis of all the scores, of all the predictivity you will find in the literature. We have uh, these two things, the multiple regression that you will see in the logistic regression. All the scores, all the predictive models are coming from here. There is no way. So when you understand, at least you must not understand uh, exactly how to do it, of course, uh, but you must understand uh, the concept. This is uh, the, the p-value that you have. means that this, uh, at the end you have this value. You see, this is the intercept. That means, uh, which is the heart rate when the velocity is zero. So you must start from something. And this, is the, and this, is, this gives you the slope of the curve. It is a regression, because you are manipulating the, uh, the speed. What happens that uh, when you are doing a correlation, you think that both variables must be normally distributed. When you do a regression, the variable that is uh, the dependent variable, the y at rate, it must be normally distributed. This is uh, true, it is not true. And honestly, you can do anything you want. But anyway, if you want to be more precise, if you have a not normally, there is the so-called rank correlation. There, you remember perhaps what was the rank. I don't know if you have uh, still this in your mind. The rank is, uh, doesn't deal with the exact value, but uh, like in the ATP uh, tennis, uh, you have a number one, uh, you have a number two, number three, independently from the value of the points. For in, now Mara is a number one with 11,000 points. The second can have uh, 3,000 points, but it's still number two. But the difference is not included in the, in the rank. Uh, for instance, uh, just an example. I, you want to find a correlation between a global ICU stay and ejection fraction in 113 patients. Let's assume that both variables are not normally distributed. If you use, uh, in this case, a correlation, what do you see? Do you see that the, the, the correlation is very low? The p-value is 0.6. But if you use the rank correlation, what you have to use, look, it becomes more uh, important. So p-value becomes significant. So means that uh, is a negative, means that the higher, with the lower ejection fraction, higher global ICU stay. So this, is, uh, this happens because you, what you are doing is uh, you are applying the proper, the proper uh, test. The ra co correlation can evaluate the correlation between the categorical variables as well, nominal, ordinal, doesn't matter. You can, for instance, globalize your stay versus mitral regurgitation versus uh, anything like uh, uh, diastolic dysfunction, yes, no, doesn't matter. So this is just a correlation and regression are the basis of the test I am talking with you now, that is the multiple regression. The first one is the multiple regression. The difference between the two most important regression analysis, that are the multiple regression and the logistic regression, then in the multiple regression, the variable that you are going to see is continuous. So you can use this to predict, for instance, the length of ICU you stay. Anything is continuous variable can be predicted by the multiple by the multiple regression. If you are investigating the, an event that happens only once, categorical, like a death, for instance, and this is the base of the Euro score and the other scores, is 0, 1. This is a logistic regression. So the difference is only this one. One gives you, a, both of them are giving a formula to predict. And one, the base is a continuous variable. You want to investigate the continuous variable. The other one, you investigate an event that happens only one like that, for instance, OK? You can use uh, any kind of variable you want. You, you just uh, must check. Uh, what is important is not to put together variables that are the same. For instance, if you are putting many variables, you put uh, to investigate the length of ICU stay, you put 20 variables. But if you put the 
body mass index is good. But if you put together the height and the weight, it's not good because both are correlated. So you must uh, take only one. So if you see things that, uh, for instance, just to say something that is not possible, the height and the length of the arm all evidently are correlated. So if you put together in the same analysis, you can have uh, not good conflicting results because they are dealing with the same variable. You want to understand the relation between a dependent variable, like a global as you stay, and some kind, some, a number of independent variables. These variables are, let us say, Euroscore, ejection fraction, preoperative MR, TR grade, emergency, and so on. I choose this just because it gives you only one, one uh, uh, result, and this will make things simpler. You see here, you have a stepwise. Mostly, are step, stepwise means that every time they are putting a variable, they are taking out a variable. Putting a variable, take out a variable in the global. You have different, you see, enter, forward, backward, but stepwise, uh, perhaps you remember, most, most popular is stepwise logistic regression, that is SRL, that is used everywhere. Here you have the, the value. For instance, you have the grade, the grade of the Michel from zero to four is a variable that has the influence of the global as you stay. And this means that there is a, this is a evidently significant, 0.01. Here is the, what is important, and I want just to spend one second. It's not difficult, but anyway, perhaps, again, it's not strictly necessary, but you must understand. You want, to, as in the, you remember the regression, you had the formula to predict. Here is a, Y is a, the global as you stay, and X is, in this case, is a, the grade of MR. A is this one, the constant, 3.2. And each value, in this case, only one value, is a coefficient of this one. So let us make the example. If you have a patient with the grade of MR3+, plus, how much is that? Can you predict the global as you stay? You do. Y is equal 3.2, that is the, the coefficient, plus B, that is here, 1.6, times 3, means 8 days. At the end, you do this directly, and you can predict it. The patient that needs to have SBR with the moderate to severe uh, mitral regurgitation, can, the prediction is eight days of ICU. I want to do another better example, just to show you what you see normally. Again, this is not global, it's the first ICU stay. You see that you have a three different bilirubin, high bilirubin, mitral regurgitation, and troponin. Again, we have the coefficient and so on. Let us see, this is the, the table you can have. Bilirubin, MR grade, if everything is equal at zero, you have a two, IC, two days. What do you do? In general, when you see a paper, when you see a, a predictive analysis, you see only this one. You see variables, you, you limit to put a zero, one, or the value you want. Why? Because these are all hidden. If you see the Euroscore, in the Euroscore you put your variables, you don't see everything. You don't see anything. And directly you have the final result. For instance, you have no, bilirubin, no high bilirubin, no mitral regurgitation, no high troponin in the moment of the operation. You have two, ICUs, two days of ICU stay. If you put, your patient has a four plus mitral regurgitation, this goes to six because the, everything is done automatically. If you have a four plus and the patient was operated on with a high troponin at the moment of surgery, the ICU stay predicted rose to 14. If you have everything, high bilirubin, uh, four plus mitral regurgitation, and one of, uh, and the high troponin goes to 20. You see, what do you, you see only the, the, the schematic uh, table and you put all the, your data and you at the end you have a result in this case is the ICU, the ICU stay uh, because it is the, what you are looking for instead of having a, a continuous variable like the ICU stay that are days you have uh, only one event that is uh, nominal yes no like that like acute MI like stroke like anything you like you want 
This is uh, the logistic regression. When the e event that you investigate is uh, a categorical event that you can identify with a zero one. If it's continuous, it's a multiple regression. Otherwise, it's logistic regression. Logis they can, doesn't mean, does need to be normal distributed. This is not a problem. For instance, here, I, again, I do a, a, an example with only one uh, uh, risk factor. In hospital vets, and you have a lot of variables you put, and you have only emergency as a risk factor. And you see here, again, uh, stepwise is the most common. You see here, this emergency is the p-value. And he is here the way you can calculate everything, like in Euroscore. This is typical of the Euroscore. And this is the regression equation that, is, that includes both of them. And it looks very complicated. It's not complicated because this for exponential you can find in Excel. In Excel, it's very easy to find it. So you don't need to do uh, all those things. But I want just uh, to show you another point is uh, the odd ratio here, like in the survival curve. Emergency is the odd ratio is 9.3. Means a patient that you are operating on an emergency has a 9.3 possibility to die than a patient that you are not operating on an emergency. So means that operating on a patient in emergency means a mortality that is close to 10, 10 times higher than the patient that is uh, operated on electively, or at least not in emergency. This is what you find uh, normally. Emergency one, this is all the, everything you need to the calculation. You, you put the calculation in Excel, and you have uh, directly this one. Zero, 25%, one, 25%, zero, 2.2%. 2 .2%. But what you see is, the, like in the Euroscore, you don't see anything. You limit to put one here, and you have 25%, put a zero here, you have 2.2%. Of course, you can have uh, more, more uh, risk factors, not only one. In Euroscore, you have uh, 15, 20 risk factors. In the STS score, you have even more. But uh, at the end of the concept, is always is exactly the same. So multiple regression and logistic regression are using the stepwise modality, more or less. Are the two multivariable tests you use when you have to evaluate the risk factors of a event that is not time depending. Because this, you need to have a specific period of time. That means that all the patients must be inside the period of time. For instance, 30 day mortality, you take 30 day. You see how long is the ICU stay it is uh, till the moment the patient is in the ICU. This is at the time that the patient is included in can be indicated by continuous or categorical nominal. Both tests as a formula to predict the event. And that is the basis of the score. All the scores that you find are published in the literature have at the base the multiple regression analysis or the logistic regression analysis. Like just the Euro score is the most common score that we are using the whole day. But what to do when you are doing the time depending events? We, the risk factors. You use uh, the Cox proportional hazard regression. Again, this is the, means that the event can happen in, in any time frame you want, perhaps in 20 years, in 15 years. So you cannot put in a specific time frame. Can be mortality or other events. But uh, the events happen in a time frame that is not equal for all the patients. So this means that you need uh, something different. The Cox proportional hazard uh, regression, normally is known like a Cox analysis, allows to analyze the effect of several risk factors. For instance, here you have uh, the Cox analysis again to see what uh, happens uh, in the, what affects the survival of a group of patients. And you see here, again, the stepwise is the most common use. You have this exponential B that is uh, the hazard ratio. And uh, this means that uh, what, excuse me, I want just to, to this is the, the hazard ratio, and you have here emergency, you see here, and the mitral regurgitation grade. This means that the patient that has an emergency is 5.4 times more, is more likely to die after, in the time frame you are, for instance, in the five years uh, or six years or seven years. And this gives you, and this is uh, again, uh, identify the severe MR. Patient with severe MR 
have three times more, are three times more likely to die than patients that have not severe MR. This gives you, you cannot have a formula for this because it is not included in a specific period of time, but at least it's an analysis of the risk factors you have. The last thing, and that's uh, the rock curve. What is the importance of the rock curve? You some, uh, sometimes you, uh, you read the rock curve identify a cut point. This is a very important. When you have a continuous variable associated with an event and a categorical nominal variable will represent the event like dead alive, you can give a cutoff. Means that the, with the highest sensitivity and specificity. Just to remind you what is sensitivity, what is specificity. Specificity. Sensitivity is the probability that the test will be positive when disease is present. For instance, you have a troponin I. The troponin I is high, there is a, there is a value when the specificity, the sensitivity is 100%. So you assure the patient that myocardial infarction. Or the, the troponin I is low, but uh, is a specific of acute MI, so it's possible that the patient has acute MI even if the troponin I is low. This, you must find a cut point for this one. And the rock curve, that is a very strange uh, name, gives you this, this image. This is, for instance, a diagnosis of ferritin for uh, iron deficiency anemia. You see here, you have a, like a square, and uh, this line, this line, uh, goes, this is 50% of the area, and this is 100% of the area. To have a, a, possi a possible significance must be in this part, like this. This is a perfect curve. It means that you have uh, the highest possible sensitivity and specificity. Just uh, to understand uh, what happens. You want to know if it is possible evaluating a preoperative and systolic volume index to find the cutoff value for higher possibility to perform SBR in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy. This is what you have. You put here pre and the systolic volume index and the possibility SBR yes, SBR no. And you, what you have is this one. You have an area under the curve that is the area included here, till here, so this part, that is 0.673. You have a, a significance level that is highly significant, and you have a cutoff. And this is important. You can say that in this population of patients, when the end systolic volume index is more is 72 milliliter per meter square or higher, there is a, the patient is more likely to do an SBR. Of course, it's evident the bigger the heart, the worse. I understand. I agree with you. But just to explain you that you can have a cutoff for a lot of things you want to do. I want just to show you uh, one, uh, let me see here. Okay, this is a ICU stay, this is another simple thing that is um, even more evident. ICU stay and in hospital deaths, you have a, you have a curb. Is a, the more ICU stay, the more likely, the, the more a patient remains in ICU, the more likely is to die, of course. They cannot stay for, <laughs> but uh, this doesn't give you the possibility, this, uh, this is uh, self-evident, but gives you a, a cut point that you find here, five. Means that uh, five is the cut point for higher mortality. You can say that a patient till the moment remains uh, five days or less is uh, still in the, normal possibility to die or to be alive. But if you stay more than five days in the ICU, his, his likelihood to die increases after five days. So this is not important to know exactly to foresee what will happen with the patient. But this is important for analysis, for analysis to know the possibility for uh, mortality, for uh, um, ICU stay of a patient, for anything you want to do. Okay, now the conclusion of everything I said. There are not a lot to conclude, but what is uh, the problem with the statistics? That you are allowed to analyze a set of data and draw conclusions that can be generalized beyond the set of data. So you are analyzing 1,000 patients, but you are taking generalization for 1 million of patients. Of course, the more patients you are analyzing, the better. The term significant 
is very seductive, very attractive. You say it's statistically significant like this is the truth. And easy, but it's very easy to misinterpret it. Because the statistical use of the word as a meaning, uh, or this word as a meaning entirely distinct from this was our meaning. The problem is that when you, so, when you say statistical significant, uh, we need to see what is going on. Uh, as uh, I said before, you can find that the high, more, a higher mortality in the people that has blonde hair, that have blonde hair, but uh, which is the meaning? No clinical meaning. So you reject this uh, is, is, uh, as being meaningless. Just because a difference is statistically significant does not mean that it is biologically or clinically important or interesting. Moreover, a result that is not statistically significant may turn out to be clinically very important. So everything depends on your interpretation. The statistics is a tool you have to have data, to have uh, a way to, 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 to address your thinking toward the direction or not. But at the end is uh, your uh, perception, your, uh, uh, what you have in your mind that uh, is the real, the, is the, the real, gives the real value to the data you have. You can find everything, but at the end of the everything, you cannot uh, find things that have no meaning. But sometimes you have a statistically non significant, but clinically significant. Mortality, of course, can be different, but uh, the patient that dies, even if it's statistically significant, this is the fact that they are dying is very important for them. So that means that there is no difference. There is difference, even if it's two, three patients more or less. Statistics is statistics, but clinically, the problem is totally different. Statistics can provide solution for our research, but also problems, and the result has to be clinically interpreted and if meaningless, rejected. This is the problem that uh, statistics. Do not build a castle on the fundament only statistics. You, but the, at the end, is a tool, it's something you can use to give you ideas, but what is your judgment is the most important thing. Thank you so much.